Good evening. Hearty welcome to all of you here. To introduce myself, I'm Rashmi Podar, who's the director of this institute, Yan Prava Mumbai. Yan Prava Mumbai is a para-academic institute that offers public programs and postgraduate courses in the history of aesthetics, critical theory, art criticism, and writing style since 2007. The institute brings scholars at the cutting edge of their fields from India and abroad to teach students and the public and to develop and share new work through courses, conferences, seminars, and workshops. Since our inception, over 1,500 students have studied postgraduate level courses with us. Our rubrics include Indian aesthetics, Southeast Asian art and architecture, yoga and tantra, Islamic aesthetics, Buddhist aesthetics, Indian intellectual traditions, criticism and theory, creative practices, curatorial processes, and community engagement. Today, we are honored to present Dr. Argra Sangupta's latest book, The Colonial Constitution. In December 1946, a diverse bunch of battle-weary Indian nationalists who had spent long years struggling for freedom against the British took up the challenge of a lifetime, drafting the constitution of a soon-to-be independent India. But curiously, the document they produced seemed divorced from their own experience as freedom fighters. In this brilliantly argued and profound book, the scholar Dr. Argus and Gupta shows us how we got here. Neither a critique nor a celebration, this is an origin story. It is a meditation on the nature of constitution making and of moments of great change. An instant classic, the colonial constitution, is the perfect antidote to the gushing accounts of the constitution that abound. In the end, this book raises an unsettling question. Does India need a new constitution? Our panelists today include the author, along with Professor Faisal Devji and Justice Gautam Patel. They will be moderated by Mr. Rajdeep Sardesai. We will begin the evening with Dr. Sengupta laying out the broad contours of his book. This will be followed with an hour-long discussion and half an hour subsequently will be question and, audio, and question and answers with the audience. I would now like to introduce our panelists and moderator. Dr. Argus Sengupta was born in Kolkata in 1984. He was educated at St. Xavier's Collegiate School, Kolkata, the National Law School of India, University Bengaluru, and the University of Oxford, where he was a Rhodes Scholar and lecturer in law. He is currently the research director of the Vidhi Center for Legal Policy, which he founded in 2013. He is the author of two acclaimed books, Independence and Accountability of the Indian Higher Judiciary, which he released in Mumbai in Gyan Prava, and the second, Haminast, a, a biography of Article 370, which he co-authored. He's a columnist at the Times of India and the Telegraph. Dr. Faisal Devji is university reader in modern South Asian history at the University of Oxford. He's the director of the South Asian Center, sorry, He's the director of the Asian Studies Center and has held various positions at the New School in New York, Yale University, and the University of Chicago, from where he also received his PhD in intellectual history. He's a fellow at New York University's Institute of Public Knowledge and was the Eves Othraman Chair at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. Dr. Devji is the author of four books, the latest being Muslim Zion, Pakistan as a Political Idea, which was published in 2013. He's interested in Indian political thought as well as that of modern Islam. Professor Devji's broader concerns have to do with ethics and violence in a globalized world. 
Justice Gautam Patel is a graduate of St. Xavier's College and Government Law College. He started practice in 1987 in Mumbai, working on commercial, corporate, and civil litigations, and also appearing in a large number of environmental public interest litigations, including those relating to the Sanjay Gandhi National Park, protection of mangroves, town and country planning issues, Mailghat National Park, the Midlands, protection of open spaces, to name a few. In 94-95, uh, Justice Gordon Patel received the first international fellowship at Pacific Energy and Resources Center, Sausalito, California, in environmental law. This included coursework at the University of Berkeley's Bolt Hall School of Law and an internship with the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. He served as the Honorary Secretary of the Bombay Bar Association for two three-year terms from 1995 to 2005 and served on the association's standing committee till his appointment as a high court judge. Rajdeep Sardesai is a senior journalist and author of the best-selling book, 2014, The Election That Changed India. With 26 years of journalistic experience in print and TV, Mr. Sardesai was managing editor of the NDTV network before he set up the IBN 18 network with channels like CNN IBN as founder editor. He began his career with the Times of India and was the city editor of its Mumbai edition at the age of 26. He's presently a consulting editor with the India Today group and anchors a prime time show on India Today. Specializing in national politics, Mr. Sardesai has won numerous awards for journalistic ex excellence, including the prestigious Padma Shri for journalism in 2008, the International Broadcasters Award for coverage of the 2002 Gujarat riots, and the Ram Nath Goenka Excellence in Journalism Award for 2007. He has also won the Asian Television Awards 2014, for Best News Presenter in Asia for the coverage of the 2014 general elections. He has been news anchor of the year at the Indian Television Academy for eight of the last 10 years, and his program, Big Fight, won the Asian TV Award for Best Talk Show twice in a row. He has been president of the Editors Guild of India and was also chosen as a global leader for tomorrow by the World Economic Forum in 2000. Mr. Sardesai writes a fortnightly column across several newspapers, including the Hindustan Times. Before I ask them to, I, I would first invite uh, Dr. Sengupta to, show, to share with us the broad contours of the book, after which Mr. Sardesai will moderate a discussion between, amongst the three panelists, and then that should go on for an hour. We haven't cast anything in stone. It could go on longer. And, and after which, we will have a Q&A. But before I invite them to begin, I just want to make a very brief announcement about some of our offerings only for the month of January. This is not up till April. In January, well, on the 8th, 9th, 10th, we've got the well-known Islamic scholar, Professor Finbar Barry Flood, who is from NYU, and he is going to be presenting a seminar series which is titled Sacral uh, Sacrality and Surrogacy in the Devotional Arts of Islam. On 16th of January, Ms. Pepita Sayat, who's been working with the Tayyam artists in the Malabar for the last 20 odd years, will be here. She just published her new book. It's out finally. It's called In God's Mirror, The Tayyams of Malabar, and it'll be held here. And, uh, and please do join us for that. Then on the 20th of January, we have Professor Akira Shimada. Uh, you may know of this wonderful exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, this great Buddhist exhibition. And a lot of Akira's work has gone into that exhibition. And he will be presenting the history of Buddhist archaeology in Andhra. And that will be held here as well. So just a few. Uh, so now I would like to invite Professor Sengupta to take us through the contours of his book. Thank 
Thank you very much, Rashmi. I think from the poetry of the art and aesthetics, that is the usual lineup of Gyan Pravaha, we've got the prose of the Constitution here today. And I'm not even going to try and make it uh, uh, something else than what it is. Uh, but it's always a pleasure to be here in Gyan Pravaha. So thank you very much, Rashmi, uh, for, for inviting me for this uh, discussion on this book. And thank you very much for putting together such a distinguished panel. And because I've got the advantage of this panel, I'm going to keep my opening remarks quite brief, also in the hope that all of you buy and read the book. Uh, but broadly speaking, <clears throat> the Constitution is a document that we all know is the framework for governance in the country. And whenever I talk about the Constitution in various lectures, uh, in law schools, and I ask students what they think of when they think about the Constitution. They say it's the Declaration of Values of the Republic. Some people who are so disposed say that it is India's statement to the world that it has arrived, um, and others say that it is the framework of governance in the country. Now, there is a standard script around the Constitution of India that has emerged, which goes somewhat like this, that the framers of the Constitution who were distinguished stalwarts, the leading lights of the time, Ambedkar, Aladi Krishnaswamy Iyer, Meenu Masani, uh, and a whole host of people uh, worked for three years under immense pressure of time to give India the constitution that it deserved. Uh, and at that point of time, it was a constitution that had freedoms for every individual, that's fundamental rights, it had a large socialist state and an independent judiciary. And that constitution has stood us in good stead for 75 years with an odd hiccup here and there. Now this is the standard script of the constitution and it has become so standard that I think the constitution today across the political spectrum everyone calls it a holy book. And whenever someone calls it a holy book it actually uh, makes me a little bit afraid and skeptical because I feel that holy books are not meant to be engaged with. Holy books are meant to be revered. And I think it would do a great disservice to the Constitution if it were treated like a book that was holy uh, rather than one that is engaged with. So in that spirit of provocation, I've written this book and called it the Colonial Constitution, which has provoked quite a few. Uh, but in that spirit of provocation, I won't give you the standard script of the Constitution. A lot of it is found in my book. But I'll start with two items of commerce, since I am in the commercial capital of India, uh, perhaps something that is not usual in a lecture on the constitution, let me start with a discussion on jute. Now jute is, was one of India's largest <coughs> manufacturing products in, uh, around the time of independence. In fact, it was so important that there is a provision on the in the constitution that is dedicated to jute. It's Article 273 of the Constitution. Justice Sri Krishna is here. He may be the only one in the audience who knew of this provision. Uh, I certainly didn't know of this provision uh, before I started researching for this book. Uh, but that's a provision which essentially says that for export duty that India has received on jute, the government of India will give three states, which are our major jute manufacturing states, West Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, a grant in aid. So you'll get some export duty and you will pass it on to the states of West Bengal, Orissa and Bihar. Now I come from West Bengal and I understand the importance of jute certainly at that point of time. Now most of the mills by the Ganga are defunct. But at that point of time I certainly understand the importance of jute to the economy. But the question really arises that is it important enough to find place in the constitution? And that is a debatable question. If the constitution goes into individual items of commerce and starts making provisions, then perhaps there is something to think about. On the contrary, let's take another item of commerce, which was perhaps the defining feature of the freedom movement, and that's salt. Now, if we take salt, there is a curious discussion that happens in the Constituent Assembly about the salt tax. Now, we all know about the Satyagraha, the Dadi March, and Gandhiji's uh, civil disobedience in relation to the salt tax. So there was a provision that was recommended by Alladi Krishnaswamy Iyer, that which simply read, the salt tax shall be abolished 
no salt tax shall ever be levied. It was a simple provision that was suggested. Now, when this provision came to the floor of the House for debating, there were a raft of objections. There was a gentleman who said that we should not go into particular items of commerce like this one. Perhaps that's true, but it wasn't applicable for jute and suddenly became applicable for salt. Someone else said that this is a sentimental provision and has no place in the Constitution. Uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, the statesman that he was at that point of time, said that there is no chance that any government in independent India will ever levy a tax on salt. So there's no need to put a provision which is of, the, of a redundant nature. Um, and someone else actually, uh, there was a lawyer who made a technical objection saying that we might want to impose customs duty on salt later, so we should not have a provision of this nature because we will not be able to levy a customs duty if we are exporting salt. Now, Rajendra Prasad, who was the chairperson, was astounded by these views that were presented and, and recommended to the House, or made a plea actually, that let us, in honor of Gandhiji, who had just died when this provision was being discussed, let us keep this provision. But this provision was not made a part of the Constitution. And interestingly, actually, as I also found out, there is a service like the Indian Administrative Service that's called the Indian Salt Service, which still exists today with a headquarter in Jaipur, which has 11 posts. And how was it funded? It was funded till 2017 by a cess a tax by another name that was levied on salt. Uh, so this is how uh, salt never found a place in the constitution, but jute did. Now what is the moral of this story? The moral of this story, very simply put, is that the constitution framers saw the constitution as a practical document for governing the nation. It was really not a set of idealistic principles on which the freedom movement was founded. It was not, in that sense, a culmination of the freedom movement. It was, in a diff very different sense, it was a kind of legal coming into existence of the Indian Republic. So it was a practical document of governance which was drafted primarily by the lawyers and there is a good historical reason why that happened because at that point of time when the constituent assembly was uh, debating these provisions uh, India had also become an independent nation so the political leaders who were also members of the constituent assembly whether it be Nehru or Patel or Azad were busy governing the nation and if you remember there was partition at that time so they had serious law and order issues to deal with. Uh, so the task of drafting the constitution was left to the lawyers. And so we got a document which was a practical document of governance that didn't change much from the status quo, the status quo being the Government of India Act 1935. Now all this is well and good. But the question that arises, and you might ask, is why is this colonial? So I offer three reasons in the book, and I will just broadly narrate those, and then I'm looking forward to the discussion that we will have. The first reason as to why I think it's colonial, and this is perhaps symptomatic, uh, or perhaps best exemplified by the jute example, is the fact that the constitution is unduly long. And there is a reason as to why this is long. We used to be told in our civics classes that India has the longest constitution in the world. Now, I didn't know whether to feel happy or sad about that particular fact. It just meant we had more provisions to mug up uh, at that point of time. But there is actually, uh, without being facetious, there is, a, there is a reason as to why the constitution is such a long document. Now, there was a belief during uh, the time of the Raj that law is an instrument to control the natives. This is broadly uh, agreed upon and there's reams of literature on this. So the Government of India Act 1935, which was a precursor to the Constitution of India, laid down in painstaking details provisions in relation to every facet of governance in India. Mind you, this is very different from Britain, where you don't have a written constitution to begin with, where everything is based on convention. But everything was written down because law was a, an instrument to ensure that the natives were controlled. And the reason as to why such painstaking detail was used was because of the fact that natives couldn't be trusted, and so everything had to be written down in law. Now that India was independent, there was the, 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 the kind of kosher translation of this was that India was not yet ready for democracy.
And because India is not yet ready for democracy, and Ambedkar himself rightly said that it, it is a topsoil, democracy is a topsoil, uh, dressing on India's topsoil, um, because it's not ready for democracy, we need to put this out in some degree of detail. Now, I'm not making a value judgment here, but this idea that India is not ready for democracy is a holdover from an older colonial idea of using law as an instrument of control. And this is why we have the a constitution that is so long that has provisions on sharing of revenues in relation to jute amongst several others. So that's the first reason. The second, which is again a very practical call that was taken by the framers of the constitution, is that we want to perpetuate colonial institutions. So if I were to take an example, the Imperial Police Service was responsible for most of the brutality of the British Raj. Now one might have thought that the freedom fighters who had been at the receiving end of this brutality, when the time came for them to do something about it, might have wanted to change it in some way. But instead we plonked for stability. And there was again a very good reason as to why we did that. As I said, we were in the midst of a bloody partition, law and order was a serious issue issue, we had fears of secession by some parts of the country, so we wanted a strong police service. So, so what happened is that the Imperial Police Service was renamed, the Indian Police Service, renaming has a, is a long vintage in Indian political life, uh, but it was also constitutionally enshrined in Article 312 of the Constitution as a all India service. The Indian Police Act 1861 continued. It wasn't changed in any way. There was no reform, there was no retraining. It was almost as if now that the government and the police were run by Indians, it would be run for Indians. This was the, this was the sentiment that was prevalent at the time. And this is why, and to connect it to the present, this is why we have such a, for a democracy, such a large police state. And this is a police state that has continued right from 1947, right up to today, where what everybody is worried about is a raid by the ED and the CBI. This comes from a certain sense of police unaccountability, and that unaccountability comes from the fact that we have an unreformed police force. But the police is only an example, and it was a valid choice to have made at that point of time because we wanted law and order. Things have just panned out very differently. The third reason as to why I think it's colonial uh, is because of the fact that uh, we have a state in the Constitution that towers over the citizen. If I were to tell you why I started writing this book, this was during the time of the first wave of COVID when um, there was a migration and migrant labor were walking back home. And there was this site which many of you would have seen in the newspapers, it was around the 30th of March of 2020, where there were about 50 migrant laborers who were huddled uh, on the side of the road and they were being sprayed by some chemical disinfectant. And this was happening outside Bareilly in Uttar Pradesh. And that for me signified that in India the state was still towering above and the citizens were still below on their haunches praying for, this, for some benefaction. And I think that there is a deeper truth here that we've created a state uh, and this is across political parties. We have continued and perpetuated a state that towers over the citizen. And let me give you only one example of this. Of course, there are fundamental rights in the Constitution, and that really is the beating heart of the Constitution, something that we all cherish, particularly as lawyers. But there are also restrictions to those fundamental rights. And we all know that Article 21 is the right to life and personal liberty. It, of course, can be restricted by procedure established by law. But there is another restriction on the right to life and personal liberty, which is preventive detention. That is the ability for the police to detain someone without any charge or legal process. Now, this is a curiosity that in a chapter that's dedicated to fundamental rights of citizens, there is a provision that, is, that authorizes preventive detention, essentially allows 
police impunity. And again, there was a reason why this has happened, because the, the days that the Constituent Assembly was debating preventive detention, there was a riot in Pahargans, and there were members who said how they had to cross picket lines to even reach the Constituent Assembly to have this debate. So you can understand why law and order was overpowering in their heads at that point of time. And in any event, we were in the middle of a partition. But the fact is that the riots in Pahargan settled down in two days. Partition, thankfully, and the, and the violence that followed settled down soon after. But the provision on preventive detention continues. And it continues not just in the Constitution, but in a whole range of Gundas Act legislations that various state governments have passed over a period of time. And this is not a theoretical matter. So if, uh, my colleagues had done some research uh, on the number of people who were arrested in India in 2021. By arrest, I mean there was some legal process that was followed. There was an FIR, some investigation, and then an arrest. So in 2021, there were 58.5 lakh people who were arrested in India of all crimes, of all crimes put together. In comparison, the number of people who were detained in India, preventively detained, without charge or without legal process, was 86.6 lakh. There were 86.6 lakh people who were picked up and they were put in prison. And the fact is that there is no, I, I, and then the, the data proves it, that there is a vast majority of this who are Muslim and an even more bigger majority who are poor. And this is, uh, and, and then the police essentially picks them up, puts them in lockup, keeps them for two or three days, and gets them, and maybe they go out after that if they can afford a lawyer. Now, this is the reality today. And some of this is because of the fact that we have created a state that towers over the citizen. So what do we do about it? Rashmi asked a question right at the beginning that does it mean that we need a new constitution? My answer is an unequivocal no. At this point of time, we certainly don't need a new constitution. I am very aware of the political environment in which we live. But at the same time, we must not deify the constitution as a holy book. And I'm, <clears throat> and I'm going to end with two things. Is that at this point of time, when we think about the constitution, we are thinking about it in terms of the prime minister and the BJP government in power. And my book is not talking about the present constitutional moment. That will hopefully be a sequel to this book. My book is talking about the fact that this is about, not about a political party, but this is about the state and the citizen. There is not a single government in independent e India that has wanted to touch the law on sedition. There is not a single government in independent India, center or state across political party, that has wanted to touch the law on preventive detention. The fact is that in India today still, the state towers above and the citizen is below. And we need to think about new constitutional ideals at this point of time. Every generation needs to do this, and so does this one. And I think this generation especially needs to do it, because whether we like it or not, we are at a so-called decolonial moment. And, de and everywhere in the world, this kind of decolonial moment starts with symbolic changes, you know, renaming of cities and renaming of roads and stuff like that. Uh, so that's how, that's how things start. But the fact is that can decolonization mean something that is worthwhile? Currently where we are and what passes off as decolonization is not decolonial at all. Because what is seen as a, a, a hallmark of a decolonial move is the recent amendment, the changes to the criminal laws. The IPC, the CRPC, and the Evidence Act have been replaced by three laws. But that is essentially colonial rule by another name. If Macaulay were alive, he would have felt very happy about the changes that have been made because that's Indians adopting. And in fact, he has a quote where he said that it will be the happiest and proudest day of my life when Indians adopt for themselves colonial institutions. And the fact is that the, <clears throat> that the criminal provisions, the impulse of decolonization is a good one. That we want to do away with criminal laws that treat the natives as liars. That's what the Indian Evidence Act does to a great degree. But what have we done? The IPC had 11 offenses which had the death penalty. We've now made it 15 offenses which had the death penalty. 80% of the provisions have, are continuing. There's no change whatsoever. Now, my question, which I want to raise with this book, is that can decolonization mean something? 
more than mere symbols. I believe it can, and I think every generation needs to debate for itself the constitutional ideals that would serve it. And my book is a provocation for everyone, particularly everyone present here today, because I see a lot of people here who are not from the legal fraternity. And I think it's very important that every citizen has a view on the Constitution. Neither is it a view that entirely denigrates it, nor is it a view that, <clears throat> that celebrates it almost as a matter of religious faith. I, my book is a provocation for you to think for yourself about the Constitution, and I hope you will do just that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Orgo. Uh, wonderful to be here in Mumbai before this audience. I want to put a caveat before we start. Uh, since we have a sitting judge of the Bombay High Court, we've assured him we will not engage in what we often do, which is constitution bashing, or even worse, judiciary bashing. You can try. <laughs> we can try. In fact, a senior advocate has just written a rather scathing and well-read piece called the Suraj Mukhi Court to describe the Supreme Court of the country at the moment. And it's well worth a read, just to look at uh, from one perspective of where a number of lawyers also see the court heading. But we promised Justice Patel that we will not engage in, uh, in, in judiciary bashing or constitution bashing. Why should I limit your right to free speech? Go ahead and do it. <laughs> okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, I be thought you be, be careful what you wish for. Mm -hmm. It I'll might prevent you getting, uh, you know, promoted to the Supreme Court. I don't but want that. You don't want to. Okay, fair enough. It's not going to happen anyway, so it doesn't matter. So. <laughs> but the fact is, we live in an age with a dysfunctional parliament, a domineering political executive, a compromised media, all of which, in a way, should draw or has drawn greater attention on the courts and the constitution. But the constitution and its interpretation is also fiercely contested, as Orgo just pointed out. Searching questions being raised even today uh, over whether the constitution and the courts do enough to protect citizens' rights, state excesses, and indeed over the role of the judiciary itself. Orgo's book therefore becomes valuable because it goes to the heart of the constituent assembly debates that led to the shaping of this constitution. In particular, his central premise, for better or worse, that we have a constitution that was meant to free us from the yoke of colonialism, but instead ended up giving us what he calls a contentious view, a colonial constitution. How should we be then looking at the 1950 or 48 to 50 project nearly 75 years later? Is the constitution still robust in serving the ends it was meant to be or does it need a relook? Do we need to therefore Indianize or Bharatiaize the colonial constitution? Uh, Orgo, let's start with you since uh, this is your central premise of a colonial constitution and it is based in some way or go around your point which you just emphasized here again that the state towers over the citizens that a constitution that was meant to protect fundamental rights instead only gave a license almost to the Indian state to become this dominant state. You use the word police state just now. But why blame the constitute assembly makers who had who devised the constitution or wrote the constitution with all fine intentions. Instead, let's blame successive generations, whether of jurists, whether of uh, politicians in particular, who have misused the provisions of the constitution to serve their political ends. The police state was not created by Ambedkar. The police state was created, dare I say, by those who succeeded him and political executives across the country. The Supreme Court has in 2006 in the Prakash Singh case spoken of police reform, but we don't have it. Instead, what do we have? We have a renamed IPC. So the question I want to ask you is why have you chosen to blame the constituent makers in a way for a colonial constitution based on the Government of India Act 1935 instead of blaming those who've succeeded them over the last 75 years? So first up, I, I haven't blamed anybody. I certainly haven't blamed the framers of the constitution and I have <clears throat> the greatest respect for what they were doing. And I certainly also, I'm not blaming political executives for this state of affairs. So I think blame is a very strong word to use. But what, there is a point there, however, in what you're, what you're saying, which is that I think it's a intellectually lazy answer to just say that let's blame the politicians. You know, I think it's, it's easy to say that because politicians are always going to be politicians and they're always going to look out for self-interest. 
Now the fact is there was a view in the constituent assembly and that was not a view that was Ambedkar's view. It was a view that was widely shared across the board because it was a time of heady optimism of a new nation being formed and that view was that the state will be <coughs> the guarantor of our liberties. It will not be the oppressor, but it will be the guarantor of our liberties. And it was a view that was based on a kind of rosy-eyed understanding of the state. Because, And this is what I find very curious, because the C Constituent Assembly actually looked a lot towards the United States uh, for inspiration. And if the fundamental basis of the United States Constitution can be put in one sentence, the fundamental basis of the United States Constitution is, man is vile. They start with the premise that men are, and they were only talking about men at that time, there were no women in the <laughs> constituent assembly at all, um, and the black people were three-fifths of human beings, so they were not talking about black people either. But, but the fact is, they got one thing right, that they realized that politicians will only be after self-interest. So the entire system of American governance is based on gridlock, and that's what you see which has gone on a bit too much 200 years down, but it is a system that is based on checks and balances. And they, because they believed <coughs> that the state is always going to be an oppressor. Now, we believed at that point of time that the state will be the guarantor of our freedoms. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons, and Faisal can, can speak to this more, is because there was an absence of Gandhiji in the Constituent Assembly. Because there was one person, as I describe in the book, who knew that the state actually would be the oppressor and that's why we don't want a state that is this large and that was Gandhi. And he kept saying that we want small government, we want local government. And, but that view was a view that was extremely radical at the time. So yes, it is absolutely true what you say, that successive governments have completely belied the hope of the Constituent Assembly. Absolutely right, and I certainly don't hold a brief for any of them. And they certainly are, are in, in entirely culpable for the state of affairs that we are in. But the fact is that as a matter of design, in the framing of the Constitution, I feel that we could have empowered citizens more and not vested so much faith in the state. I'll come to the Gandhi-Ambedkar debate a, a little later, but let's, let's just take off from where uh, uh, Orgo leaves, which is that his central argument being that the constitution makers had the opportunity to put the citizens' rights first. And they squandered what was possibly an opportunity at the time. Let's also be clear, 1947-48, India was a very different India. This was a country recovering from the bloody scars of partition. And therefore, that hung over the constitution makers. But do you accept that view that let's not blame successive generations, whether of politicians or indeed of jurists or... Do you feel that this big state is almost endemic to the way we are as a people? No, I'm not sure that I agree with this entirely. I think it's perhaps a flattening that's unjustified historically for two reasons. It was, just, it was not just 47. Uh, it was not just partition in 47, 48. And by the way, uh, don't be misled by the cover of this thing, okay? It's, I haven't, like this British flag and so on. I haven't read this as a screed against the Constitution at all. In fact, quite the reverse, which we'll hopefully get to at some point. At the time when the Constituent Assembly was engaging in this exercise, it was being asked to do something that quite literally hadn't been attempted ever. I mean, for the last several tens of centuries with only ever being ruled. We are, we were now being told that devise a document by which the people will rule themselves. Now this required a, something more than the classic Indian jugad. You couldn't just slap together something like this. There had to be some level of practicality and I'm not sure that with all the benefit of 70 years of hindsight we can knock that back quite so easily and label it colonial. There were considerations at that time and one of the telling factors is the composition of the Constituent Assembly. It's actually quite an astonishing set of documents when you read the Constituent Assembly debates because there were people from all walks of life. They weren't all lawyers, they weren't 
jurists. Some of them were barely educated, but they represented constituencies, peoples, across the length and the breadth of the country, all set about debating the intricacies of what we wanted India to be, which is a very difficult exercise because you had to first agree on that concept of India. And then you had to fashion some method of making this happen. And looking at these constitutions, you were then taking what I thought, what I still think, is one of the most electrifying and dramatic leaps of faith, which is to really craft that preamble and say, look, this is in part three, parts one, two, and three, a document essentially at its heart for the people and on which we are tacking on all the other practicalities that go with it. So I am not 100% sure that the argument that is made about it is entirely correct without reflection on needed nuance, context, and so on. Look, I am saying this quite clearly. Since it was adopted, this constitution has been under threat. And that's probably the best argument in favor of the constitution and a justification for the argument that it is poor people because this is what the governments fear. People have tried to diminish the constitution initially from the top down. Take away this right, take away that right, curtail this right, curtail that right. That didn't work. That didn't work. Even on preventive detention, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that. It's courts that have constricted what governments can do in a series of judgments controlling them. I, Justice Sri Krishna will agree because uh, he, in his time, I and mine, both came, were forced to handle preventive detention matters, never having done them in our lives. And suddenly you're confronted with this utterly bizarre constitutional pr provision. It is a bizarre provision. It is a bizarre provision. It is inexplicable. It is colonial. We can't explain it. But it's there. It's a minority report kind of science fiction thing. You're thinking of a crime? No, Insight. The, you know, uh, Justice Patel, in his book, to quote from the book itself, and since you're talking about preventive de detention, he says, in one stroke, the constitution not only legitimized preventive detention, but also signaled that in newly democratic India, the needs of the security of the state were weightier than the newfound freedom of citizens. But that's Look that. at how that has been interpreted in today's times. We are sitting here in Mumbai. Think about how, if I may be allowed to say, the Supreme Court has looked at Jammu and Kashmir, where people were in jail for two years. Your Supreme Court, the Apex Court, sat on it for two years ah, and did not... And in virtually eventually denied people their basic right to life and liberty that's under Article 21. That's a separate because you argument. Had, no, you had in, you have the constitution has given you all enough opportunities to interpret in a way to say, look, security of the state matters. That's how you looked at Jammu and Kashmir. No, the the success or the failure rate of the Supreme Court or of any high court is not a reflection on what the constitution provides. That's a totally different thing. If we were to discuss whether the Supreme Court has pulled it off has done the right thing, whether it should have engaged more, that's a discussion that can perhaps take all night. We were talking about what the constitution it itself provides. And but I'm telling does you... Does it have a libertarian outlook or not? It essentially does, but at some points there are awkwardnesses, gaucheries, and I'm telling you, preventive detention has always been, like sedition, one of the most inexplicable portions of our jurisprudential structure. Do you know that the judgment, the leading judgment from the Supreme Court on sedition did not refer to a lot of English case law. None of it was contemporary in England. All of it was a hundred years old. And that's the thing that has carried forward. The reasons why they wanted preventive detention may be many. But I don't think it defines the constitution. That's the only point that I'm making. No, let me just press you for, for, a, for a moment there. because. You know, the, the fact is, as we've seen, even with sedition laws, you've got now the Bharatiya Nyay Sahita, the new IPC. It, if anything strengthens the ability of the state to use na the new laws to, to even make sedition uh, more discretionary on the state. 
The state today can charge you under treason for what you say, for, for, your, for your words. Uh, effectively, what, what the new law does is, is expands the powers of the state. So I just wonder whether this is drawn, the state draws its inspiration from, as Orgo calls it, a colonial constitution, or does it draw it simply because the Indian state has moved from being a Gora Sahib state to a Maibab state? Obviously the latter. So the mindset Obviously has the remained latter. the same. It has. It has. This uh, state go governments do not enact law because of the constitution, but despite it. And that's where courts step in. That's where we jump in and say, this is what you can do, this is Sometimes. what you can't do. Perhaps not as often as Argya would like. <laughs> but that is what, all right, that's what they're supposed to do. Not whether they've actually pulled it off or not pulled it off. Okay, look, there are two things. There's power to amend. Kargya discusses this in the book. The power to amend, including fundamental rights, which is in the Constitution, was later curbed by intervention by the Supreme Court to protect fundamental rights. Okay, fair enough. But if you look at the inspiration and the U.S. Constitution, the first suspension of habeas corpus was not here, but was in America, and by none other than Abraham Lincoln. That's historically established. Governments everywhere will do what they can, irrespective of their ideologies, to retain power. This constitution, I think, does two things, and I, okay, let me tell you how I'm reading the book. The constitution does two things. It vests a set of, it, sets out a set of ideals, and it vests a power in the people. And that it did for the first time after independence. We never had anything like it, not on these lines prior to that. If we are today, whether it's in the name of terrorism, security, state security, giving up those rights, the point that I think Argya is making is that there's a lot of good in the Constitution. Let's not compromise but it's time to engage with, just have a look. You have the book with you, just, may I just read you one passage that I thought was just absolutely terrific. Uh, it's, this is towards the end, just before the timeline of events, uh, page 216. This is not a call to draft a new constitution today. We live in polarized times and any constitution that emerges out of such a time is unlikely to be long-lasting. But it is a call to think more deeply about the Constitution rather than merely extolling its virtues in a rhetorical fashion or criticizing it unthinkingly. The Constitution creates a towering state that stifles individual initiative. It creates big governments that diminish the role of local communities. It gives citizens fundamental rights, but hedges them with a slew of restrictions. At the same time, it spells out a clear vision of a more equal, secular, democratic India with free and fair elections based on universal adult franchise. If India is to prosper, it needs to embrace some of what the Constitution has to offer the promise of freedom, communal harmony, and equality. Equally, it has to reject some other bits, preventive detention, rights without meaningful duties, a colonial state which over time has become a rent-seeking one. India today needs an honest conversation about its colonial constitution and whether it is ready to chart its own constitutional course. The time for banal homilies is over. I agree. I think that's beautifully put. That's absolutely correct. I mean, there's no point deifying the Constitution and saying, look, this is such a glorious document. It does need change. It needs the right form of change. But the answer to that, which you'll find from all kinds of quarters, is junk the whole thing. But for what? And with what intent? 
If you read the preamble today, and you know, really, it's, it's as a student of law, Justice Sri Krishna will. Okay, Justice Sri Krishna. This is a deeply devout, learned, scholarly man. But there is one piece of writing that, in for me, transcends almost any other form of writing which is just the balance and the power of the words in the preamble of the constitution. It's the whole damned package, the whole of it. If you want a concept, okay, this is a bit difficult. My father is 92, in 1947, young man, What was he thinking? I mean, this is threshold of a dream, no? This is what I, as an Indian, I want my country to become. He's part of this project. I'm telling you the preamble of the constitution actually aims and tries to deliver that. But then it gets muddled. Then it gets muddled with a bunch of other practicalities which nobody has seen as time worn and perhaps we should now. Which, which brings me to the point, Faisal, that, you know, there's a historical context to the making of this constitution that Orgo does go into the book. The fact that this is a period of upheaval, of a bloody partition, of the integration of princely states. So there's a sense that the state is imploding and therefore you need a, a highly centralized unitary constitution in a way in a subcontinental sized country which was meant to have a federal constitution but essentially the document became a compromise between various viewpoints because that was the only way you could achieve some kind of stability in these times of chaos do you see that historical context being important and therefore when today in 2024 we are going to discuss uh, whether the constitution needs a review or a new constitution, we've got to accept that 47 to 50 India was in a very different place to where it is today. That historical context, do you see this as a constitution of compromise, essentially, between varying viewpoints? There was, not, there was no one viewpoint that could have ever dominated uh, the discourse at the time, beyond the fact that we needed a secure state above all else. Yes, well, I'm not so sure about that argument. You know, it has been made recently in a somewhat snide review of your book that appeared in Frontline magazine. Um, and I was immediately struck by it because by the time India becomes a republic in 1950, it is not undergoing the throes of partition violence. It That's has cool. stabilized as a state. There was no need at that point to inscribe all of these depredations of liberties into the constitutional text. There are many parts of the constitution which are meant to be provisional. These were not made provisional. Uh, but the provisional items in the constitution strike me as being theoretically, conceptually the most interesting. Whether it has to do with asymmetric federalism with Article 370, which of course was rendered an exception and therefore couldn't be generalized. Whether it had to do with the prevarication over the national language, still the case or with the maintenance of personal law, a vexed issue. Uh, and there are others of this variety, reservations, meant to be provisional, but constantly uh, uh, reissued. And these provisions make the Indian Constitution strikingly original. But they have been made provisional measures, even if they are constantly reiterated. Right. So I think uh, there's a problem here with the argument that uh, a partition and its violence forced the government to, uh, uh, to uh, retain all these draconian measures. Now, of course, it's true that a constitution of a country which has not gone through a revolution will necessarily inherit something from its past. And India has a long constitutional past. That is natural. It happens in most post-colonial <coughs> countries. And in this sense, India's constitution, apart from those provisions I was mentioning, it's not very different. It might be longer than any other constitution of post-colonial country, but it follows, or they follow, its model. Because India's model was then exported uh, here and there to the rest of the decolonizing world, which, of course, freed itself after India 
achieved her freedom. But what I think is important here is that there's a contradiction. On the one hand, yes, you do have the inheritance of these draconian provisions, which could easily have been, in my view, negated by the founders. But on the other, what seems to have justified them was their desire to make the state into something quite different from the colonial state. The colonial state was meant to keep things in order. It was not meant to be revolutionary. India did not emerge out of a revolution, but its contradiction was that it inherits a constitutional history while at the same time trying to make the state into a force for change in society. And that's why these provisions, I suspect, were felt to be necessary because you needed a powerful state to change India. In that sense, it's not colonial at all, though it relies upon the legislation of the colonial period. So I think it's that contradiction between a non-revolutionary achievement of freedom and the revolutionary ideals of the founders that you find uh, uh, taking place within the Constitution. Now, of course, this is a problematic thing because how much trust, as Orga was saying, do you put in the virtues of the founders or of our legislature? our legislators, uh, and will they really be driven by that ideal of transformation? Ambedkar, who of course, from very early on, from the 1930s already, had envisioned a state of this kind from annihilation of caste, exactly. where he wanted to regulate Hinduism by the state and have the state set exams for the, uh, for the appointment of, Bra of, not Brahmins, of priests, priests. Uh, who come from all castes. Uh, he wanted the state to act in this manner. By the time he quits Nehru's cabinet with the failure of the Hindu code bill, he turns back to society. Curiously, paradoxically, he does what Gandhi was doing. Exactly. He realizes that the transformative state he had wanted is A, not working, and B, is very likely to become a despotic state. And so he, he, he repudiates his own constitution. He goes to work in society, and he turns to religion. You couldn't think of anything more Gandhian than that. Though, of course, he's routinely opposed to Gandhi these days. Uh, so I think even among the founders, you have a, rethink, you have a kind of revaluation of this constitution and what it's meant to do. But there is the Gandhi-Ambedkar fundamental debate over how they perceive the constitution. Gandhi locating his vision of the constitution in kind of village republics. And Ambedkar fiercely opposed to it because he believed that village, the villages were the source of corruption uh, of the worst kind and it comes from his own personal experience and it also perhaps comes from his determination that he wanted social justice above all else. Mm. For him the constitution was going to be an instrument to ensure social justice. For example, Orgo can call it a colonial constitution but no colonial constitution was going to provide reservations. Mm. So I mean in that sense Ambedkar in his own way wants to revolutionize new India as it was at the time by bringing in laws that would provide social justice above all else. Gandhi in that sense was far more conservative uh, mm -hmm. but talks about the village republic. Mm -hmm. Is that, and, and Ambedkar seems to triumph over Gandhi, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at the end of the day when you look at the constitution mm -hmm. today. Uh, again, we've got to look at how they perceive the con uh, their value systems in the, in the 40s and 50s and what they'd gone through. Would you agree that, you know, all of these debates therefore 75 years later, really don't serve the purpose unless we accept what was driving and motivating the constitution framework in, uh, from 47 to 50. Now, I think I agree with you in the sense that it's the debates that we have inherited, not so much the details of the constitution. Those, because you can ask yourself the following question. If you get rid of the laws of sedition and preventive detention and all that, would this become an ideal constitution? I don't think Orgo is arguing that this is a matter of details. It's a set of debates that we have inherited, and those go back to the founding of India as, a, as the Raj, as a colony. Uh, the Queen's Proclamation of 1858 is arguably the original constitutional document of this country. It came after the mutiny, the brutal repression of the mutiny, and in it, Queen Victoria professes to grant her subjects, her Indian subjects, with liberty and equality, fraternity is not really mentioned much, not because uh, there's this supposition that Indians cannot be fraternal because they've just proven that they were fraternal during the mutiny with Hindus and Muslims coming together, but rather because 
the constitutional structure of the colonial state was, I believe, uh, not merely colonial, but also liberal at the same time. And for liberalism, fraternity poses a big problem because liberalism depends upon the idea of individual, of individual rights and individual as well as collective interests. If you have self-interest, it's difficult to fit them into a, a logic of fraternity. Now, what kind of liberty and equality did the proclamation ensure, and how did they come to define constitutional debate in India, I, I would argue, to our day? One was the liberty to profess your own faith. That was how liberty was defined in the proclamation, religious. Religion, therefore, becomes crucial to all later Indian constitutional debate. The second had to do with equality. Here, equality between Hindus and Muslims in terms of their treatment by the state. In making this case, the colonial state is set up as a liberal state, as a neutral third party there to arbitrate between the various interests, contending interests of the Indian people who are later understood as having nothing that puts them together, that it is the state that needs to mediate between them contractually. Otherwise, they would be at each other's throats. Now, liberty and equality, I think, go on to become the crucial ideals uh, uh, that inform debate in India. So for someone like Ambedkar, it was equality. This is a question of what comes first. Congress said that we must have liberty first. And when we have liberty, we will be able to solve the problem of inequality in India. Because how can we do it without liberty? The Muslim League and Ambedkar, among others, argued, no. If we have liberty first, then you will perpetuate inequality for majoritarian reasons. Therefore, you must ensure equality first. Uh, and when you do that, then liberty becomes possible later. So in both cases, there's a time lag envisioned. The Congress says, OK, let's have liberty. And we realize that we won't all be equal overnight, but we have set up a project which will enable equality in the future. The Muslim League and Ambedkar and others say, no, no, we don't trust you. Uh, we need to work towards equality first, even if it means retaining colonial rule for a while. Ambedkar even calls the colonial state a dry dock. It's a dry dock. We need it. We need the colonial state. Now, what happens in 1947? Everyone somersaults. Ambedkar is faced with a new situation. He needs to speak differently. Nehru, similarly. And what you have is this, uh, uh, the making of the Constitution with all its wonderful ambiguities and fruitful contradictions. I agree with Justice Patel. The, these are not demerits. Uh, they allow us to think more deeply about it. But what I would like to suggest is that this vision of whether it's liberty first or equality first continues to animate political debate in India today. And that goes back to the Queen's Proclamation of 1858, which, though it might be forgotten today, was at the time received by Indians, much to the annoyance of the British. The British thought it was a symbolic document. But Indians claimed it as their Magna Carta. They called it the Magna Carta. And I'm sure you've seen, if you go to the Victoria Memorial in Calcutta, under the rotunda in the dome, you have the proclamation of 1858 engraved in the languages of India, and of course English, which is also a language of India. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh Orgo, let's come to the second part uh, of your book in a way. One of your other central premises that the Constitution of India ensures that Delhi towers over all the states. And this is significant. We are in a state like Maharashtra, where President's rule was declared at midnight, where it was revoked at 5 a.m., uh, where, a, where a government is sworn in at 7 a.m. at least Maharashtra hasn't become a union territory. At least, but, but you know, <laughs> yes. given what the Supreme Court has... Given what the Supreme Court has just said in the Article 370 judgment, it gives enough powers. Uh, you know, simply if the President of India one day wakes up and decides that Mumbai needs to be a union territory, so be it. You've got your parliament majority which will allow you to do so. But the fact that you believe that the Constitution itself gives these, uh, gives even greater powers to our occupants of Raj Bhavans and the President of India than the colonial governors had. Is that something that again, you believe, stems from this concern that India could break up. This was the 19th. Again, I repeat, this was 47. I know yeah. you're saying 50 in the world was in a very different place. We hadn't had a free and fair election until then. There were still those who feared that India could balkanize or split apart 
Churchill, among others, believed that even uh, the first election would result in, uh, you know, in, in India splitting apart into different parts. So, in that sense, what was what was perhaps necessary, some believed, in 1950, has now been used again by the political executive, uh, in a manner that why blame the constitution? Let's let's blame the the, the political executive that is supposed to uphold the, the spirit of the constitution. So, Razi, first up, I agree with you entirely. This point that you've made in all three of your questions so far, that the constitution framers did the best of what they could at that time given those circumstances. And we now can't judge them on the basis of what has happened today. And I think it's entirely... I mean, it's not my case at all that I'm saying that they that they did something entirely wrong at that point of time. They did the best they could, and it's worthy of a great deal of respect. And I think we just want to put it out there very clearly. Now, the second point is that in relation to the state towering over the citizen, like they did the best they could, every generation succeeding must do the best that they can, and in this case, we can. Now, what was the central premise of this idea that this Delhi must tower over the states? And the central premise was essentially that the way towards integrity of the nation is through a strong center. Because if you remember just seven months before that, we were discussing the cabinet mission plan. And the cabinet mission had an entirely different architecture of federal government with the center, then those groups of provinces, and then the provinces themselves. Very few powers in the center, foreign affairs, defense, communications, everything else at the local level. And But once cabinet, the cabinet mission plan was junked with, and Pakistan was out of the way, there was an immediate reversion to a strong center because the idea was that that was the way to protect the unity and integrity of the nation. Was that a reasonable thought at that point of time? Absolutely reasonable conceptually. I don't think there was a, there, there's any disagreement conceptually. But how was that operationalized? And here there are two points. The first is Article 356, which is the provision all of us know as President's Rule and has become infamous in independent India. Now, there's an interesting history in that in the constitution order of 1947, and I go into that in my book, which was the last act of the British, continuing the Government of India Act and the Indian Independence Act till such time as India could get its new constitution. In that order, the British themselves had deleted Article 356 because they felt that no democratic state needs an article of this nature. If a state government is unable to govern, then new elections and there will be governance. If the state government is unable to govern for an interim period, some caretaker government, you don't need it to be run from Delhi. That is what they wanted to do because as Leo Avery said, this is our safety valve. And this is the whole of the Simon Commission talks about how this is the safety valve that the British need ultimately to ensure that we can give a little bit of governance to the Indians. But if we really want to take it back, we can take it back through this. So they couldn't humanly conceive that this is something that Indians would choose for themselves. So one is that while the conceptual premise is good, the actual implementation of that was through a tool that was so centralizing that it meant that it was no longer really federal in any shape or form. So we have this kind of happy ambiguity where we call it quasi-federal. So it can be federal sometimes and centralizing at other times. So that's, that's the first point that it went to a certain extreme. And the second point, and since you mentioned uh, Article 370, I think this is a, the, the, one of the interesting parts of the judgment, and I don't want to make this a discussion of the Article 370 judgment, is that there is an underlying premise through the whole of the Chief Justice of India's opinion in the judgment that the purpose of Article 370 and the purpose of uh, ensuring that relationship was one, of enhanced integration. Those are his words and not mine. Enhanced integration. It keeps coming back in that judgment that what Article 370 is trying to do is enhanced integration. The fact is that Article 370 was not about enhanced integration at all. Article 370 was essentially about collaboration, that the future of Jammu and Kashmir will require two hands to clap. You will need the people of Jammu and Kashmir and the people of the rest of India to agree on something and then it can happen. But where does this idea of enhanced integration come from? It seeped in into that judgment and into a lot of judgments of the Supreme Court. This idea comes from this inherent centralizing bent that the constitution has, which we 
all kind of in the legal fraternity we all know that there is a centralizing bent that this constitution has and i think that's how it seeps through in this particular judgment as well and because and at this time in this generation is unity and integrity an important conceptual goal maybe it is i don't want to have a deba debate as to whether it's not but maybe it is what is the chief threat to unity and integrity today the i in my view the biggest threat to unity and integrity of india today is a strong overly strong central government that is what the chief threat is this is the exact opposite of what it was in 1947 where you actually want a strong central government to try and ensure the extremities stay together i think today it's kind of flipped on its head if you have a central government that's too strong that is saying that you know you want everyone must do everything in hindi for example that's kind of the biggest threat to indian unity today and not a weak center so have have we confused then justice patel taking off again from what orgo says the need for integration and unification with the eventual goal of centralization and that is really where the fundamental problems lie in trying to impose for example language uh, on 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 the states of the south now there is talk of a uniform civil code and we can we, we you know we can debate the uniform civil code separately but it's the next hot potato that will be out there but it's you're absolutely right that is in fact what has happened and i well to put it differently i don't think it's happened by constitutional design the problem is the conflation of delhi with the concept of the union of india delhi is the union of india that's the real problem therefore how do you balance this with concepts of unity and regional identification and independence of this because the real my bap sarkar is delhi now will we as as a result also end up conflating somewhere notions of unity and integrity with notions of uniformity you know there's so much of focus now on the need for uniformity uh, almost and 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 the fear of course going ahead is that it'll even grow further uh, if you have a dominant government at the center it's a very real fear and that's precisely the reason why i think the point that argyo makes is that these conversations and these engagements are absolutely essential on an ongoing basis at every level see one of the fundamental points that's in this book is that look there's so much worth preserving don't sacrifice it don't be too ready to give it up because there's some stuff in it that needs to go so sure, there's stuff in it that needs to go so sure, there's some stuff that's outlived its life it really has it's this it's dead it's no longer relevant in 2024 we can identify those portions you make those amendments nobody is really going to criticize it but those are not the targets of oh those are not the objects of amendment affection at all the entire exercise is find some method to curtail exactly liberty and equality systematically what's what you're seeing today is a steady constriction of liberty step by step by step without that we are going to have a real problem in the years ahead without a defender of liberty you are going to have a real problem in the years ahead you cannot compromise the freedoms from 14 to 21 for anything you may get rid of the restrictions on those freedoms which is fine you may okay let me explain that uh, article 19 set of freedoms but the subsequent subsection say that those freedoms can be curtailed on these rights curtail the curtailments mm, expand the freedoms this it you, you take take uh, all right no, so your media hang, hang on Rajiv, being... your media censorship this entire concept of well this censor board is something i've never understood oh 
who are you to decide what I want to see or what reaction? No, the Indian mind is too immature. Really? We can throw you out of power, but we can't watch a film. Seriously? We are going to be corrupted and perverted by a book, but we'll unseat you in the next election. Really? This, this entire tussle is to strip agency, strip liberty, nuance by nuance, aspect by aspect. It's a lesson we haven't learned from, from there are many things to criticize about the English law, except that when it comes to the defense of liberty and the actual defense in courts, the standards are so staggeringly different from ours that it's sometimes like an alien world. Why? Why? The answer All right, is, so why that's, is it that we, we, are, you know, we are constricting freedoms from... If we would have thought that we would have become a much more open okay, society, let, let much me, more self-confident. Uh, Instead, we've gone the other way around. Can you imagine? People can enter my kitchen and decide yeah, can whether you, I'm, can you imagine uh, you know, a what situation? kind of meat I'm eating. All right, that's one. Can you imagine a situation where uh, there is a criminal charge against you, but the prosecution bends over backwards to make sure that you get a fair trial and that every available defense is made available to you, even at the cost of a conviction? No. It's not happening in India. What are we counting? Why haven't you convicted these people? Why are your conviction rates so... I mean, we ask this question, even in law, even in courts, what is it that you want to see more people in jail? I mean, is this a concept of liberty that's constitutional? Now, why has this happened? This is one of those structures that needs... Why is the Prakash Singh case still floundering? It just passed its... 20th anniversary, nothing's happened. Except Prakash Singh's got a whole lot older. No, but Poor I, fellow. If, if, I may pre, you know, if I may press you once more, uh, why is it that the freedoms have been constricted from our, uh, between our, uh, This is the in, point. In, in the last 30, 40 years. It, it, is it to do with the structure or the concept of the constitution or the manner in which the no, judiciary no, now interprets it? No. I mean, existing case law gives you it, enough a space to say bail not jail and yet including the apex court keeps on denying people their fundamental liberties. The uh, constitution unfortunately as Arga puts it, recognized and acknowledged the continuance and existence of already oppressive systems and integrated them into its fabric. That is what has been built upon and the other problem that you mentioned is not about courts doing or not doing, but just being inconsistent in doing it. If you're going to say bail, not jail, you have to apply it uniformly. So is it the mindset of judges then? Possibly. Possibly. But Rajdeep, No, no, I agree, it is. Have they over time become more conservative, less willing to to expand the boundaries of what well, should constitute freedom. Point, well, I'll, I'll, speak for, I'll speak on his behalf because it might be very awkward for him it's to not, say this. It's not. nothing about judges. I think it's nothing about judges of today. It's I think it's a mistake to think that somehow judges today have become really conservative, have bending over backwards. I was only going to say judges are human beings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bending over back. But judges have always been human beings. And judges have actually always been fairly conservative. Because what you get from the legal fraternity, as in is these episodic acts of heroism, which are true. There have been these cases like you hear of a Jagmohan Lal Sinha who quashes Indira Gandhi's election. But the only reason you hear about the same kinds of cases repeating themselves is because there are only one or two. There aren't really that many. Judges actually have not really expanded the our freedoms very much, number one. And number two, as in, and since the fact as facts are, are sacred, if you talk about these freedoms and why these freedoms are being curtailed, the beginning of that 
was the first amendment to the Indian That's Constitution, correct. Correct. which was brought about by Nehru's government, which expanded the set of restrictions on the basis of which you could restrict free speech. Correct. So whereas the first amendment to the US Constitution is a right yes, guaranteeing free speech to every this individual, went the other way around. this went right the other way and and that was actually one of the reasons why Ambedkar also becomes disillusioned with the state <coughs> because he realizes that actually this state is no guarantor of your liberty, it is going to be an oppressor. Given the fact, therefore, Faisal, that the objectives, therefore, were laudable, the idealism was laudable, you've looked at Pakistan very closely. Look at two countries which, uh, you know, emerged from the womb of pa partition and look at the directions in which they've taken, that they've taken. In that sense, should we see the glass as half full in, 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 in this country? That, to a large extent, diversity also has been preserved. I mean, we can always... As, as, as journalists look at the glass as half empty, but there is much to celebrate also in the, in the way the constitution has evolved in India and contrasted with our neighbors in Pakistan, uh, who perhaps had similar uh, sort of objectives, but clearly didn't fulfill them or gave far greater space uh, for uh, the excesses of the state. Well, you know, I think that the, the Pakistan, like India, inherits the Government of India Act 1935. So many of its constitutional provisions are very, very similar. And all these details uh, are there in Pakistan as much as they are in India. Uh, the, there's a difference in a similarity here. So for India, and this goes back to what Orgo really writes very well about federalism, you know, coming up to the cabinet mission and after. Uh, after partition, India junks the federal idea which makes you think that they were acting in bad faith. If it was only, if it was a principled idea, they needn't have junked it. It's as if, and this is an awkward thing to say, it, was, it had been people like Ambedkar and Jinnah who had guaranteed the federal idea in India because they are the ones who wanted it. The moment they left, you junk it. And you have what ends up being for decades a one-party state in India. It is eventually you have regional parties that emerge and only very late, only after the emergency, do you have a non-Congress government at the center. That's true. That is an extraordinary thing, right? Now, that one-party state, of course, doesn't see itself as a one-party state. Occasionally, it bans other parties, like the communists. But it sees itself, like many post-colonial states, as a developmentalist one that needs to sometimes ride roughshod over the law and our liberties the people who were uh, uh, proclaiming the liberties of ownership, property, and right, were Zamindars and Talukadars and people like that. So they were dismissed as out of hand. These are capitalists or landowners, feudal elements, and therefore we can't take their arguments seriously. But the arguments needed to have been taken very seriously indeed. So what happens <coughs> in Pakistan? In India, you have a one-party state that is created after the fact, before partition, there was a multi-party state in India. Okay, very restricted and separate electorates, but there were more. There was, Congress was not the only game in town. I'm reminded when in 1939, Congress goes out of power. It demits power because India has been taken into the Second World War without its, without it being consulted. Jinnah, Ambedkar, and Savarkar come together right. on a platform, proclaiming a day of deliverance from Congress Raj. Gandhi, being Gandhi, writes to Jinnah and says, even though my sympathies are entirely with the Congress, I admire this because what you have done is put together a coalition of groups of parties that will create a, a real opposition and therefore the seeds of democratic governance in India. And I wouldn't mind if you end up being the first prime minister or whatever. You know. He understands that he doesn't like any of these parties or any of these individuals, but he understands that structurally speaking, India, for whatever reason, has already become in part a multi-party state. Congress doesn't want this because it has this ideology that you need everyone to come under this big umbrella, and then you have the state that transforms society. And with all of these parties, you can't do it. Now, Pakistan, what happens there? There, you don't have a one-party state. You have any number of parties, and you have a kind of collapse of the democratic system, which is why the army steps in. So the army performs in Pakistan the role that Congress performs in India. 
you know, it needs, it thinks, it needs to hold together the society and, well, they are not so interested in transforming it. Unlike India and Congress, where the objective is transformation, in Pakistan it's about what the colonial state did, holding it all in place and, you know, giving more room to uh, establishment uh, figures and uh, groups. So their motives are different, but there's a kind of interesting parallelism that's going on there. Since you mentioned Gandhi and Savarkar, let's look in this final part of options to this colonial constitution. And we are in an age where people constantly talk of the need for a constitutional review. There are those who talk about the need for a Hindu Rashtra and what would a Hindu Rashtra constitution involve. Two, two alternatives that were talked about at the time or go. One was uh, the Gandhian constitution that would put a would give primacy to duties over rights, would give primacy in a way to village republics over a more centralized constitution. And then you have the Hindu Rashtra version, which would perhaps look at the secular state in particular with, with suspicion, if not contempt. Interestingly, as you mentioned in the book, the Hindu Mahasabha goes along with what was seen as the predominant mood of the time and says, this is the constitution of the country and we will go along with it. Do you see any of these two other directions which the constitution could have gone in as perhaps being in some way more valuable? Could elements of that have been integrated or have we reached a stage where we need to relook at the constitution looking at these alternative visions? See, I think the Gandhian constitution was certainly an alternative idea of India and its governance mechanism. A more radical idea. Yeah, definitely a more radical idea whose biggest champion and biggest opponent was Gandhi himself. Right? So Gandhi does this very interesting thing where he's encouraging uh, Gandhians to write a constitution for free India. So Sriman Narayan Agarwal, who later becomes governor in Gujarat, ardent Gandhian, writes a document called the Gandhian constitution. It very dutifully reproduces Gandhi's ideas of duties in the constitution. It's not duties uh, as opposed to rights, but duties side by side with rights. Uh, and also this idea of small local government. So it's a government that invests most amount of power in the local panchayat. Local panchayats then elect the taluka, the taluka the district, and the district the government in Delhi, which again has very limited powers. Now, Gandhi, however, so Gandhi champions this in the early 40s as he's championing this idea, but he realizes that this idea is too radical. And he himself says that he's very happy to go along with the, what he calls the Anglo-American version of the constitution, because the purpose of a constitution is to ensure justice and peace across communities. The Muslim League agrees with this kind of large state understanding of the constitution. And so Gandhi says that, you know, anyway, the constitution is a policy document. A son does not obey his father as a matter of policy, and we have to look within. And so he starts talking about the constructive program and so on. And the Gandhian constitution dies a kind of natural death. So the Gandhians in the constituent assembly actually are left searching because there's Kengal Harumantaya, who later became uh, chief minister in Mysore, who says that we came here to hear the music of the Veena or the Sitar, but instead hear the music of an English band. And how do they look to undo that? By putting in all kinds of Gandhian provisions into the directive principles of state policy. which in Including prohibition. You've got prohibition there, you've got villages as the local unit of governance, no, no one knows what that means, prohibit ban on cow slaughter, all of it is put there because, as T.T. Krishnamachari has said, that this has become a dustbin of sentiment. So everyone is kind of riding his hobby horse into that, into that dustbin. So there's a kind of face saver that is given. But I think there is an idea there which needs considering, which we haven't considered, which you see constantly coming up in Indian political discourse, irrespective of whether it's Indira Gandhi or Narendra Modi or Jawaharlal Nehru, which is this idea of duty. This idea of duty keeps coming up and the way in which it kind of translates if we don't think about this and engage with this idea is that it becomes a duty to the state. Like, you know, you must stand up when there's a national anthem and that kind of stuff. You know, and the 42nd Amendment actually did a great disservice to the idea of duty because then duty became conflated with the most anti-democratic amendment that has happened. But I think the Gandhian idea of duty, the duty that citizens owe each other and 
Rajdeep, you and I both live in Delhi and I know that we both know that the duties that citizens owe each other is basically zilch, right, in Delhi, certainly, if not in other, pa other parts of the country as well. So, I th but I think there is a serious idea there in terms of duties that citizens owe each other. So, I think that's an idea that's worth considering. The second, and I think the Hindutva constitution is an interesting constitution. Uh, because the Hindu Mahasabha in 1944 drafts the constitution of the Hindustan free state. First up, it's not an alternative to the constitution India, of India. It looks very much like the constitution and follows that, that basic framework. But I think what's interesting about the constitution is, and I think this is something that's critical to understand, that Savarkar is writing Essentials of Hindutva, he's written it a few years before, where he's saying that only a person who has both his Pitrabhubi and Punyabhubi between the Indus and the Indian Ocean is a Hindu and so has rights to be in India. But at the same time, the Hindu Mahasabha, during his presidency, drafts a constitution which actually has provisions on secularism that are stronger than the constitution of India. It has a provision which says India shall never have a state religion. Savakar, of course, is a known, known atheist, so he puts this provision. Second, it says so that India, so there will, there cannot be, according to that constitution, a constitutional Hindu rashtra. Secondly, they say there shall be no discrimination between on the grounds of religion. Third, all minorities will have the right to run their schools and script and culture and preserve their script and culture. So, basic framework of minority protection. So, how can we explain this contradiction? And I think this is critical to understanding also, I mean, how parties within the Sangh Parivar also think about the constitution. Because the fact is that I think at a certain level, there is a degree of reverence to the constitution as a mainstream reasonable document. And I think the playbook of Hindutva is not so much in the constitution. So I disagree with this thesis of, you know, that the constitution, there is going to be an assault on the constitution and so on and so forth. I don't think there is going to be an assault on the constitution at all. I think the constitution means a lot more and the fact that Ambedkar has drafted it means that it's also politically becomes much more sensitive. So I don't think there is going to be an assault on the constitution. And I think that what the contradiction between the essentials of Hindutva on the one hand and the constitution of the Hindustan free state shows is that Hindutva as a doctrine is a doctrine that operates in society. It's not a doctrine that operates in the plane of the law and the constitution. And I think we must be aware of where these challenges lie and we must be aware to not miss the wood for the trees. No, no, but there may, there may be no assault on the constitution per se, but there could be an assault on constitution values. You see, because I doubt many of the warriors of uh, Hindu Rashtra today have even read what Savarkar wrote about it in the 1940s. They look at it as a political, you know, it is about political supremacy. So therefore, there could be an assault on constitution values, if not on the constitution. So I think this is where uh, Faisal's point about a one-party state is actually an interesting one. I mean, I think that there is something of the Congress playbook again coming back here. And what we are seeing now with the BJP is that I think like the Congress was essentially running a one-party state, as I think that's the goal of the BJP to run a one-party state. And I think that's, so it's essentially, and in a lot of ways, whether it's the constitution or whether it is political uh, aspiration, I think the BJP today, as in, in terms of the constitution, it's perfectly happy with an Anglo-American constitutional model. I don't, I think it gives, there's, there is, and, and I think with good reason, as in, I think it gives great international respectability, the glass certainly looks half full and not half empty, and it's actually a way of announcing India as a self-confident nation that can live with its past. At the same time, in terms of its political playbook, I think it's very much taking a leaf out of the Congress book between the 50, between the, in the 50s and the 60s, and what it's looking for is domination across in, uh, in the Union as well as the states, and I think that's the political goal that, that it has set for itself. That's a good point on which to open this up. Uh, uh, to a new, uh, to the audience, uh, we've, we've gone on for almost an hour now. Uh, we'll open it up the next 20, 25 minutes to audience questions. Just put up your hand, do introduce yourself, and uh, we'll take as many questions as we can over the next 20, 25 minutes. Uh, which side? Is there a mic? Yes. There is. Okay. Yes, yeah, well, why don't you start, Justice Sri Krishna? Dead. Justice Sri Krishna famously destroyed one year of my life <laughs> or a few years of our lives by making us appear before the Sri Krishna I, Commission I, I, which was then dumped into the Arabia. Your report no, sadly no, no, was no, dumped no. into the Arabian Sea. That's right. Sadly. Uh, uh, sadly, all the commissions that are headed, 
their reports are dumped in the Arabian Sea. That's ex an unbroken one, record. Except one that was the pay commission, which because everybody got more oh money in that. <laughs> the evil that men do lives after them. Don't forget that. Okay. That's now, the point is this. Hey, look. The preamble to the constitution gave us a charter. So, it is our duty as citizens, judges, lawyers, to ensure that all other provisions are read in the guidelines that is provided by that. So, if today the constitution has given us very high values and they are not happening on the ground level, is the constitution to be blamed? Are the constitution makers to be blamed? Or do we have ourselves to be blamed? I mean, I mean as a judge and as a citizen also. Because I remember, as a journalist, you will probably remember, who is it that said, a famous man had said, that it is not the constitution that lets her down, but it is man who is evil. Who said that? I forgot that. You so I, I, I remember Nani Palkiwala famously saying, we have a first-rate constitution run by third-rate people. No, but that, I remember this word, evil, the vileness, or, or rather the evil of man lets you down. I don't know who has said it, I have forgotten it. I read so many things, including law sometimes. <laughs> now, the point is this. The point that I am making is, the values are very much there and if, the con if we feel that the constitution has failed us, it is because we have gone about it wrongly. And talking about your Maibab theory, Maibab theory might have started in 1947, but it came down all the way to ADM. Remember the ADM Jabalpur? Yes. ADM Jabalpur was on Maibab theory only. The state is a great, you remember that? Diamond heart and diamond, diamond strong and all that. Let, let me put that to you. Do you believe that it is, uh, has, has the, have we failed the constitution? Is that a, is that one of the homilies that at the end it's of the book? It's not a homily. Uh, you know, the, 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 not, this sort of, the, 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 this sort of outrage, I, I, I this sort of almost, this. this regular outrage we that have, we have We have, okay, qualified. We have failed to build on that which it asked us to build. You know, there is this extraordinary exchange that happens in the courtroom and it's written up all over the place in ADM Jabalpur, Shivkan Shukla. All right, this is the famous habeas corpus case. Emergency. Essentially, your right to liberty has been suspended and the government can pick you up and chuck you into jail. You may be a college student. And there is a beautiful passage in H.M. Sirvai's book written with his usual quiet magisterial style, but which when I read to students makes them weep because it tells you of the arrest, detention and torture and death in custody of a 17-year-old student in Kerala. Horrifying. And this exchange in the Supreme Court, I'm just trying to imagine this, where the Attorney General is arguing and a question is put to him. Are you suggesting that a police officer could pull out his revolver and shoot a man in the head? The answer from the Attorney General, now this is the government's view at that time, was it shocks your conscience and it shocks mine, but consistent with my argument, yes, he could do it. That was exactly the answer of Attorney General Nirende. We missed it by a whisker. You're talking about a glass half full, half empty. I think that's the wrong question. I think they're trying to crack the glass. That's the problem. Don't let them crack the glass. It doesn't matter how full or how empty it is. This problem with fundamental duties is a real problem. How does my citizenship, how are my rights as a citizen, how are my liberties linked to a duty? Exactly. You can't make this linkage. You can't say there's some neighborhood principle that applies. I mean, be nice to Orgyo because you know he knows so many people in Delhi. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there, is a, there is a theory. Uh, Gautam, there is a theory. And this theory is quite serious. The theory is that in the ancient days, the king or the ruler considered himself subject to some restrictions, some guidelines by what were the, the scriptures. Therefore, there was no occasion for him to transgress that. During the foreign rule, there was no question of following the scriptures. Therefore, the citizens, they had to devise a situation where the citizen could stand up and say, hey, you do this, otherwise you are wrong. 
and that is why the court said to go into all this uh, article, the entire chapter, part three. Okay, let, let me get more questions in. Uh, yes, the young man here. Yeah, thank you all very much for the very interesting discussion. Uh, my question is, what are some of the constitutions in the world that do the best job of preventing the state from towering over or dominating the citizens? And what sort of amendments can we make to the Indian constitution to incorporate some of those features of the other hungry? constitutions? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, oh, no, no, hold on. Hold on. We're, we're, we're going to take two or three questions together and then we'll get answers. That's one. Somebody I'm else. Dinner uh, now. <laughs> uh, uh, the gentleman there who looking suitably like a lawyer, go ahead. Or corporate executive. In Mumbai, the, the lines are, are blurred. <laughs> Don't exist. <laughs> uh, good evening to the house. Uh, my name is Vedant Vaishali Jayant. I'm a fifth year law student at MNLE Mumbai. Maria. So, law. <laughs> so, my question is to the panel. When we think about reforming the constitution, does the panel think that the doctrine of basic structure is somewhere acting as an Maria. obstacle to reform the constitution because in the basic structure judgment, the parliamentary form of democracy was one of the f basic structures. But we have leaders in this country who say that India should have presidential form of democracy. But is this reform really possible because of this doctrine of basic structure? Okay, basic structure, which is the constitution that perhaps protects uh, fundamental rights. So one more question, uh, a, a, a lady, yes ma'am. Yeah, okay, we'll come there then. Um, hi. Uh, actually, this is for Professor Dev Ji. I'm so glad you brought up the historical aspect of this, given that today is 5th of January, the first imperial assemblage, aka yeah. Delhi Darbar, in 1877, was held in first, on the 1st of January. Lord Lytton, uh, sort of a couple of days before that, had made several sort of statements regarding the sovereignty of the Indian peoples. And yet, like, again, coming back to historically significant numbers, you have 70 years after that 1858 proclamation, you saw the British rule go down, sort of go down and we got independence. So could you elaborate a little bit more on, like, sort of the imperial ramifications of that particular era on the constitutional sort of, um, let's say, organization with which they came into the constituent assembly and they, when they started making these, were these things, like I said, they were barely 70 years ago from that 1858 proclamation. So quite a few people would have had that within like sort of familial or ancestral memory. So what would sort of be the ramifications of that period on the later period when the constitution was being framed? Okay. Olga, why don't you take the first question of the, uh, is, yeah, there sure. a, is there an ideal constitution out there? No, I mean, there is no such thing uh, as an there, ideal in, constitution. No, in, in any part of the world that, that perhaps does no. more to protect fundamental see, rights one than is, any other. One, I think, is that we need to see constitutions in terms of their particular legal culture. So I don't think something can just be transplanted from somewhere and put here. Uh, but I think, number one, uh, I mean, since we, as, as, as Indian lawyers, we tend to look to the West, I mean, the American Constitution does a great job in protecting individual liberty. I mean, there's a lots of problems okay. in the United States, but I think freedom of speech and expression is not one of them. Yeah. You just see White House correspondence and how they ask questions right. of the president, and that's clear that there is a certain kind of freedom that's TV shows. that's that's ingrained, and, and TV shows and 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 whatever that comes with its that with its share of rabble rousers, but I think that's the price that American society is willing to pay and I think there's there's something to be said there. In terms of newer constitutions, as in the constitution of South Africa actually is a great example of a constitution drafted in 1996 post-apartheid uh, constitution that also thinks of the state actually as a guarantor of welfare of people, but imposes some serious duties on the state, particularly on matters such as health and education, uh, which are sort of very critical matters to South Africa, were critical matters in India as well, but perhaps we didn't think about it as much. So I think these are these are two kinds of examples and as he said, as in I could go on and on, but I'll stop here. Justice Patel, basic structure. Oh, so I am ans answering that question with another question. What is it that upsets you so much about our noisy, chaotic, crazy kind of democracy? You want one guy sitting there deciding it all for you. You don't like the manic quality of a uh, democratic system, what's wrong with the structure as you currently find it? Wouldn't you like to have a voice? Or would you rather risk a move towards totalitarianism and despotism by putting all of that power in the hands of one man? Okay, why do you talk about 
a presidential government. Let's talk about having an elected municipal commissioner and no municipal council. Let him run a city like Mumbai. You think he'll do a better job? You think he's going to be? You know, the problem here is that the basic structure is essentially about accountability. It's essentially about enforcing a level of accountability. And that's most easily taken away. You want examples of this? Look at what happened to personal freedoms in the United States of America immediately post-2611. See what Rumsfeld went and did there. 9-11. 9-11. 2611 was asked. 9-11. Have a look at what they did and how they dismantled it under your great presidential systems with no oversight. Read Jane Mayer on this, The Dark Side. Horrifying introductory chapter should tell you enough. Because we have no less than the vice president of the country now calling for a review of the basic structure doctrine, suggesting that it undermines the powers and the rights of parliament. Okay, he said that. Pezzel. <laughs> but he says that, so it's all right. Pezzel, is there an imperial legacy that goes into the 19th century essentially and therefore our parliament, uh, uh, our constitution was drafted at a time of uh, great upheaval. You'd gone through 70, 80 years of, uh, of, of colonialism, imperialism and that shaped in a way a lot of the views is I think what is being suggested. Yes, uh, but uh, with the proviso that the imperial nature of the constitutional history in India is also a liberal history because the British were unable, there is no such thing in that sense as a colonial plus, uh, uh, argue, con colonial constitution that the British drew upon liberal, the details might have been draconian and not available in England, uh, but the structuring of not the constitution but constitutionalism in colonial times is liberal through and through. Uh, it's, you know, English utilitarians, Jeremy Bentham is crucial, John Stuart Mill is crucial, both the Mills, James and uh, John Stuart Mill, uh, who are both working for the East India Company. Uh, Burke uh, is important. Uh, and the English are unable, they don't have, as you're saying, a, consti a written constitution of their own. And that sort of preserves parliamentary sovereignty, but at the cost only in the context of extreme conservatism because otherwise it falls apart. So custom and practice. Once they start experimenting with constitutionalism abroad in the colonies, they can't, they draw only so much from their own tradition because the constitutionalism of India is different. In some ways it's, it's very much the same. If you look at the Indian Penal Code, which has been mentioned here, Macaulay is its author. Uh, it is the first, um, uh, to my knowledge, uh, instantiation of secularism in India before, because there's no blasphemy provision. It's turned into this now famous thing, hurt, hurt sentiments, and so it's made uh, comparable to libel and eventually defamation. It's stripped of its theological character, even though Britain has a blasphemy law until the 1990s. India never does, because of course, how could it? It's a religiously diverse place. The king emperor or the queen empress cannot be head of the Church of England, of there is no national church, and therefore India experiments legally, constitutionally with, with secularism in some way before Britain itself does. So the colonial constitution is in many senses a liberal constitution. Uh, it has terribly draconian uh, provisions in it, but the reason why it could be inherited, mm. I think, is because of the liberal parts of it. Now, you might be critical of those parts as well. You might think that liberal constitutionalism is not the ideal. Uh, and Congress was faced with this dilemma. How do you have revolutionary change uh, with liberalism? Uh, and that's where the problems that Olga writes about really emerge. Let me get two last questions. Uh, the gentleman there, yes. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Suharsh. I'm a corporate lawyer practicing in Bombay. And Orgo and I go back a very long time. We were roommates in law school. Um, so this is more of a frustration coming out of sharing a room with him for five years. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? 
having said that, uh, so this question is addressed to, to Orgo. Um, so one of the things the book notes is that the Government of India Act 1935 had been reviled as a charter of slavery. Now more than a third of the constitution was directly borrowed from that hated law. And that being used as one of the premise or one of the arguments to say that therefore we have a very overpowering state and a very unitary uh, constitution. Um, how do you juxtapose this with three examples which I'd like to quote, which do not form part of that one third of the Government of India Act, but was new in our constitution. Number one, the chapter three, which is fundamental rights, where freedom of speech, freedom of expression, and so on. So how would a colonial constitution grant those rights to, if I use the word subject, quote unquote. Second, again in chapter three, the fact that untouchability was abolished, being a, you know, extension of horizontal concept of fundamental rights, which we did not see even under the US Constitution for a very long time. In fact, the way a civil rights movement grew in the US, many of the cases in the US Constitution were on the basis of the interstate clause and less on the equality clause. And thirdly, the fact that in India from day one, we had universal adult suffrage. Again, something which was granted to US citizens much after the Constitution was adopted. So just trying to understand if these three examples militate against the, the thesis that we have a colonial constitution. One more last question. Uh, yes. It's on. Uh, it's on. Good evening to the house. I am Tatva Dabadia. I am a second year law student at Maharashtra National Law University, Mumbai. So uh, my question essentially goes to all three of the panelists. Taking the point that the constitution let, may, might not be a, consti uh, uh, a British or Anglo-American constitution, but was seen as a opposite to what that state was, a reformative constitution, as uh, Dr. Faisal sir said. So at certain times after reforms, we also need a constitution which will keep things in place. So we attain number one, then we need something to keep things at number one, right? So, after, so where does that transition takes place from a reformative state to a stable state and how does then that react with social morality? Because constitutional morality also somewhere differs with the social morality and the social positions and the position of the citizens of the India. So a Sabrimala temple, so some were advocating to be a part and then a social morality was saying something else, constitutionalism was saying something else. So, so where do we see that homeostasis coming in? Okay, let's... You want to answer that, uh, yeah, sure. your, your old colleague's question? Yeah, It's an interesting question. Yeah, my roommate for five years always has asked me the toughest questions. But uh, <laughs> uh, I'm tempted to say that uh, we'll discuss this over a drink outside. But, uh, but I'll answer it. Uh, one is that it's never my claim that the constitution right. is wholly colonial. That's not my claim at all, number one. So now, the title was designed by your publishers to strike a chord. And, and, <laughs> and the sense... To, to sell some copies and I think it's doing a great job in that and, and, and no, so, so one is that those, the three examples you quote, actually two of those examples I've also quoted as saying that these are strikingly original parts of the constitution, universal adult suffrage and untouchability together with reservations, though as Faisal also said that it was made provisional reservations, but these are very original provisions of, of the Indian constitutional framework and are not colonial at all. As far as the point on fundamental rights are concerned, I think the fundamental rights are, as I've said, hedged with severe restrictions. And I think they're hedged with restrictions in such a way that allow for an overpowering state. So I think there is a kind of law and order basis to that fundamental rights chapter. And so if and, and here, and this is actually quite a quite quite interesting, that the that the first person to say that this constitution was colonial and seemingly drafted from the point of view of a police constable was Somnath Lahiri, who was the only communist member of the constituent assembly. So there was a sense that even the fundamental rights chapter didn't go far enough. So I think that that one is a bit complicated, but the other two are strikingly original provisions of the constitution. And so certainly that's not my claim that the constitution is wholly colonial. And as far as the this question is concerned, the second question, I mean, I, again, it's a very long and complex answer, but I'll just keep it very, very short. Uh, just say one thing, which is the fact that we are only 75 years old at this point of time as a democracy. And that's young. In, in terms of global democracies. Oh, 75 years down, the, the United States were fighting, was fighting a civil war and the country could have been ripped asunder. So I think we have a long way to go, 
but where we want to go is something that we need to constantly discuss. And I think that there will always be debates about whether something is in tune with morality or not. But I think the, that is a discussion that we need to keep having over a period of time so that we get somewhere we want to. You want to quickly respond to the constitutional morality yeah, question because a lot of judges nowadays uh, speak about constitutional morality when they're not in court but outside. You see, when All they're the in time. court, they don't, you know, they... they well, they, there are a few judgments. It's not like there are none, but that's not the point. The first part of the question about when are we going to reach a position of stability or stasis is simply to say, I hope never. Because that's exactly what you don't want. You don't want conformity. You don't want stasis. The point about the constitution is that it should be able to lend itself to changing times, needs, mores with a minimal amount. Of, you know, it has to be a framework for a society. So at, one, at what point will it reach stability? I don't know. And frankly, I hope it never will. Is there a divide between constitutional and social morality? Bound to be. That's also by design. Because constitutional morality sets out what the underlying principles, ideals, desires, aspirations. This is what you should have. This is what you should be. This is what we should be. Whether social reality is kept up with that is, well, how do I put it? It was Twitter, now it's X. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me do what Orgo has done with the title of his book and ask you as a sort of headlineable, what does Justice Patel think? In the, in the constitution as it stands today that needs to be amended right away or scrapped? Immediately? Yeah. Oh, the preventive detention portion. Straight away. I, it, I cannot wrap my head around that. I've never been able to do it. We've done judgment after judgment saying that this has to be done, but it seems to me utterly incongruous that in uh, Article 21, you could do the right to life and liberty and protect it and then proceed to say, it shall not apply in cases of preventive detention, and so on and so forth. Then it has unfortunately, I think, colored a lot of thinking about our criminal jurisprudence. It actually has. In regular criminal, it has affected the way we approach our uh, criminal statutes, our anti-terror statutes, uh, the actions that the enforcement directorate takes, the kind of powers that we are willing to cede to these authorities, there's a lot of that has been colored by provisions in this in the Constitution. I think that's completely wrong. You've appended burden of proof, presumption of innocence. As Shankar Rao Deo said, this happened because members of the drafting committee were never sent to jail, except one, yeah. Kanahiya Lal Munshi, Munshi, who voted against the preventive detention, detention. provision. Okay, let me leave it there because I think what we've managed to do is at least have what unfortunately doesn't happen too often at the moment, which is a sane, rational conversation. <laughs> that's and well maybe, maybe that's the starting point. And Orgo, I think your book triggers that debate uh, in a way that perhaps will hopefully uh, enlarge the space for a public conversation on a contentious issue. So without talking at each other, but talking to each other. Thank you all very much Thank you. for joining us.